Hello. Welcome to the online service for Sunday the 26th of July from Belmont Presbyterian Church. I'm Mary Rose Gibson, a member of this church, taking the service whilst our minister, Reverend Nigel Craig, is on holiday. Wherever and whenever you are watching or listening, I hope you feel part of our worship. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. These wonderful encouraging words from Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11 set the theme for this service. The theme is hope. There are many reasons why any of us might find it difficult to remain hopeful in these days, both globally and personally. But I hope by focusing on this theme, we might be both challenged and encouraged. Let us pray. God of hope, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your hope in us. Thank you for the opportunity for forgiveness. For our thoughts of despair, forgive us. For turning away from you, forgive us. For our fears, forgive us. For our failure to listen to others and to you, forgive us. Help us in the way we live to show our trust, faith and hope in you and in your promises and help us to reflect your love for us towards others. Amen. A moment now for any children who might be watching. Do you know there's something I've started to do that I haven't done since I was a wee girl? Who likes colouring in? Well look, here are some coloured pens someone bought me recently. Aren't they great? All stored on a wee roll so that I can take them about the place. Do you know, I didn't think that when you were an adult you were really allowed to colour in. But you can. And you can even get special books for adults to colour in. I like choosing all these colours and find it very relaxing and rewarding turning a white page to one full of colour. I wonder how many of you at some point have coloured in or drawn a rainbow over the past few weeks. Isn't it amazing that these rainbows have been popping up everywhere? I've enjoyed spotting them in windows when I'm out walking or driving. Those rainbows cheered me up. It seems that it was children like you that painted or drew or coloured in rainbows to thank all the people who were helping us when we had to stay at home. It made me think about the time in the Bible in Genesis when a rainbow was mentioned. Some of you will remember it well. The story of Noah and his ark with all the animals and the big flood. People had not been treating each other very well and there had been rain for 40 days and 40 nights. That was a long time and there was flooding everywhere. Finally, the rain stopped and a rainbow appeared and God said, I have set my rainbow in the clouds and it will be the sign of the promise between me and the earth. God was saying he would not let a big flood like that happen again and the rainbow means that we can have hope. After rain there is sunshine and there is hope. Sometimes we can all wonder if the rain will ever stop or when we are down will things ever get better. But God is saying to us there is always hope and the rainbow is his promise that there is that hope. Let us pray. Thank you God for the beautiful rainbows we see in the sky after rain and thank you for your promise that you will always love us. Amen. And now our Bible reading which is taken from the book of Lamentations. By way of introduction to this reading there are many references to hope in the Bible. The context for the use of the word are varied. Many are found in the Psalms and in Paul's letters. I've chosen the reference to hope from Lamentations as the main Bible reading today because it mentions hope where you might least expect to find it. 
For Lamentations, as its name suggests, is all about suffering. It is generally thought by scholars that it was written by Jeremiah the prophet. It's a lament, a witness to extreme suffering. Jeremiah witnesses the fall and utter devastation of Jerusalem. Murder and carnage were rampant. What is interesting is that whilst acknowledging his feelings of desolation and despair, he also recalls his awareness that God comes alongside suffering and is compassionate. And in this passage, hope is mentioned twice. The first time it's loss and the second how it's regained. Let us listen to the word of God. Lamentations chapter 3 verses 16 to 26. He has broken my teeth with gravel. He has trampled me in the dust. I have been deprived of peace. I have forgotten what prosperity is. So I say, my splendour is gone and all that I had hoped from the Lord. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind and therefore have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Amen. What can you see? A glass of water. Is it just a glass of water? What's really there? The optimist sees the glass as half full. The pessimist sees the glass as half empty. The engineer sees the glass as twice as big as it needs to be. The business analysis would prefer to see the liquid at the top and the air at the bottom to make the contents more easily accessible. The cynic wonders who drank the other half. But what do you see? Would those who know you call you an optimist or a pessimist? Is your world filled with aspiration, expectation and possibilities? Or is it sceptical, uncertain, disappointing? What about hope? Is it a necessity or a luxury? Realistic or delusional? The word hope appears in many forms nowadays. From the colloquial, hope to see you later. Through the business-like, the company hopes to see annual growth of 5%. The traditional, where there's life, there's hope. The personal, I hope my children will be happy in life. To the pertinent, I hope they will find a vaccine. I hope we can get back to normal. But where does your hope come from? Random chance, magical thinking, calculated risk assessment, the will of God. Hope has a special place in the Christian faith. It is mentioned in the Bible close to 130 times. But what is the difference between modern common hope and the biblical understanding of the word hope? A current dictionary defines hope as a feeling of expectation and desire for a particular thing to happen. That's a kind of wish fulfillment. I really want something to happen, but I know I can't actually make it happen. A Christian journal suggested this definition of biblical hope. The confident expectation of what God has promised and its strength is in this faithfulness. The differences stand out. Common hope puts humanity at the centre under our terms, our conditions, our needs. Biblical hope recognises God's will as being the fulcrum of its being. Our hope, after all, comes from God, and the trust in him will help us be confident of that hope. A faith and trust in God is implicit in biblical hope, but absent in common hope. Biblical hope trusts, this, trusts that regardless of this world, 
God will keep his promises. Common hope just crosses his fingers and wishes for the best. What are just some of these promises from God? Well, the statement of a Christian's belief, as listed in the Apostles or Nicene Creed, is a good place to get a reminder. Included therein, we state we believe in God, in Jesus Christ, in the Holy Spirit, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, the return of Christ, the life everlasting. Aren't all these such wonderful truths for which we hope and trust in God? And our biblical hope is bound up in that trust and faith. Surely it can't be a coincidence that during this pandemic, the rainbow became a symbol of hope. Hand-drawn and professionally printed rainbows popped up in the windows of small flats and large houses, on walls and fences, in shop fronts and entrances to towns and villages. Yes, it was a colourful way of thanking the NHS and others for their care of us. But it was more than just a thank you. It was a sign of the trust that we would be looked after by our key workers and others. And a sign of hope that we would get through this. We so take it for granted that we might forget that the rainbow is a powerful biblical symbol. A sign of that covenant of God's promise to his people. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you. A covenant for all generations to come. Genesis 9 verse 12. This was just one of his promises. Promises that we trust that keep us hope filled. The bigger biblical story unfolds with God's people continually breaking their promises. But God never breaking his. Hanging on to hope can be really difficult. At times we can all feel it slip from our grasp. But nowhere in the Bible does it say that having hope is easy. Yet it does say that it's possible. The Apostles' letters, the Apostle Paul's letters in the New Testament are saturated with hope. Perhaps the most famous reference in his letter of encouragement and guidance on living the Christian life to the Corinthians, he writes, These three remain, faith, hope, and love. Now we know and remember well the next part of that verse, and the greatest of these is love, and of course it is. But Paul points out that alongside love and faith, hope is essential to our Christian witness. It is the vital third leg of the tripod, which supports and steadies our Christian life. And in deeply cynical times, it can be overshadowed. Aren't we as Christians called to be a hopeful people? Whether it be the current pandemic or concern for the environment, it isn't easy to be hopeful, especially in the midst of either global worry or personal tragedy. But so many references to hope in the Bible arise out of feelings of despair. And surely we can take encouragement from that. The reading from the book of Lamentations was a great example of this. From feelings of searing loss, Jeremiah knows that our compassionate God is with him in his suffering. Hope remains. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. This is not a vague, wistful hope drifting from some fairy land. This hope is rooted in a trust of God, even in those dark times when we feel overwhelmed by genuine anguish and hopelessness. That is where I have found solace in dark times myself. The knowledge that countless figures in the Bible have suffered and still believed. Hope in the face of suffering is faith. Hope is essential, helping us to mature and blossom in our belief. Hope that exists not just in word, but by example. 
Isn't it interesting that Jesus never actually used the word hope? He didn't need to because he was the very essence, the embodiment of hope. His hope was all action. His hope was the manifestation of God's promise of love and hope for all of us. Time and time again, he took on the hopeless cases. He encouraged, healed and transformed the people whom others had abandoned. The disgraced woman he met at the well, the possessed man found wandering amongst the graves, the incurable man who lay for 38 years by the pool of Bethesda, the despised and corrupt tax collector, the woman ostracized for her bleeding. The list goes on and on. Christ brought hope to everyone. Christ brings hope to you and to me. Christ was hope personified. And this is our challenge. This is what we are called to do. We must make hope manifest in the world, in our words and actions. We must share our faith and hope and love with others. There are even small ways we could try and stem the predominance of cynicism and negativity that can engulf even our daily conversations. We might adjust the tone of our chat with others, for example, when it risks spiraling into mutual agreement about the appalling state of everything, the country, the politicians, the economy and the whole world. Maybe we could look around a little more carefully at those around us deemed hopeless cases and help give them dignity with our words, our money, our encouragement, our time. And finally, let us consider the one thing that might prevent us from embracing hope, fear. A potentially very destructive emotion for such a short word. Four letters that can cripple, erode and overwhelm us. Fear of the future, fear of failure, fear of loss of control, even fear of what hope means for us, the changes it will bring. But it may seem strange, but fear and hope are often linked. Let me take you to the words of an unseasonal but appropriate Christmas carol, O Little Town of Bethlehem. First verse. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. That little unremarkable town of Bethlehem held the manifestation of hope in its shabby alleyways. Its hope was that the Son of God, the Saviour of the world, would be born there as had been foretold. Yet that hope was always tinged with fear. Joseph, Mary, the shepherds were all told not to be afraid. Hope and fear can mingle uncomfortably, but we must remember that fear is not the opposite of hope. Fear gives hope a space to thrive if accompanied by faith and love. The opposite of hope is despair, but the enemy of hope is indifference. The lockdown in the UK was announced on March the 23rd and came into full effect about the 25th. Interestingly, leap ahead nine months from that date, the length of the average pregnancy, that most hopeful of things, and we come to the 25th of December. Even these fearful times are filled with hopeful significance, a celebration of God incarnate. After all, wasn't Christ's birth the embodiment of all our hopes, making sense of our universe? Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus' birth, his life, his teachings, his death, and his resurrection tells us that God is with us and always gives us hope. And now Liz McCormick will lead us in our prayers of intercession. Let us pray. Loving and caring God, we thank you for the gift of prayer and the opportunity to make our requests known to you. We ask that you will watch over all who suffer, the lonely, the vulnerable, 
those who are ill and those who mourn. And we give thanks for all those who bring help to others and pray that you will keep them safe and sustain them in their work. And Lord, we think too of all who are facing the worry brought by so much unemployment at this time and pray that new opportunities will be provided for them. And as we think of the turmoil in your world, we pray for peace and justice among nations. And within communities where there are divided opinions, we pray that all may show tolerance and have respect for one another. We give you thanks for the long and dutiful life of our Queen and pray that our leaders in government will turn to you for guidance in their decision making. For those Lord who do not recognise you or who are struggling with belief, we ask that they may know joy in accepting your grace as they come to faith. We pray that our Presbyterian Church moderator, the Reverend Bruce, will continue to have a fulfilling term in office, even though his plans to travel may be restricted. And we ask that you will give strength and encouragement to our ministers and all who offer pastoral care to our communities at this difficult time. As our church buildings open for the fellowship of worshipping together again, we look forward to knowing that your presence will be among us. Loving and gracious God, we pray for ourselves, that we may be steadfast in our love for you and our love for our neighbour. We thank you for the hope that you have freely given to us in the person of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Saviour, in whose name we offer these prayers. Amen. This benediction is taken from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 15. And may it help you through the next week and beyond. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.